My time says half past, so we'll make a start. Welcome to God's house. Uh, we're studying the crook in the lot. This is what the book looks like. If you want to buy it online, Amazon has it. You can download it also. It's the modern version in modern English, Thomas Boston, and uh, modernized by Jason Roth. So a, a valuable book to have on your shelf to refer to. And in fact, like today, we won't actually finish the whole chapter. There's some things at the end, and so that'll be homework for you uh, rather than go over time. It'll have us go back and look at those applications, apply them to our own lives. So the crook and the light... Uh, the crook ordained. Let's just recap quickly. There were three sections. There are three sections of the book. Part one, which is faith in suffering. There's six chapters, I think, in this first part. And chapter one, which we've looked at, and chapter two, last week, the first week, of course, was the PowerPoint on, on Thomas Boston's life. Um, the chapter one was a just view of afflictions. And this is one of the most important things. If you don't get anything else out of this lesson to view the just afflictions, the just view of afflictions with regard to infirmities, trials, and the crook in our lot. And that is this, consider the work of God, who can make straight what he has made crooked. Ecclesiastes 7.13, we looked at the remedy itself, to wisely see the hand of God in everything you find bearing down hard on you. Consider the work of God, especially in the crooked, rough, and disagreeable parts of your lot and the crosses you find in it. Secondly, the suitableness of the remedy as for the crook in your lot, God has made it, must continue for as long as he decrees. Chapter 2 we went into, the crook explained, and you may remember there's a doctrine that Boston draws out for the second and third chapters, so we finish that doctrine today. Uh, chapter 2 was the crook explained, and that doctrine was, whatever the crook there is in your lot, it is of God's making. And the crook itself we looked at there. Today we come to chapter 3 of part 1, faith in suffering, and chapter 3 is the crook ordained. Let's come to prayer for a minute. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, fill our hearts with joy, we pray. For this is your day and we've come to your house. We've come to sit at your feet and to learn of you, to listen to your word, to apply that word to our hearts. Help us by your spirit to do this, uh, to press these things to our consciences, that our faith may be increased this day, that our joy may be increased, that our knowledge of our Savior may be increased, that we together with all God's people in many places today worship you in spirit and in truth. Be with us in this lesson, we pray. Give us a good understanding of the trials and the difficulties that you yourself place in our path. Pray for our Sunday school teachers, uh, for all who meet and teach your word. Be with us, be with those who cannot be here, who are hindered uh, for various reasons. We pray your blessing upon them too, as they perhaps meditate on your word or stream online. Bless our time together. Help us, Lord, for Christ's sake. Amen. So you should have an outline which you had at the door. There's a lot of scriptures in the outline. I'm not going to quote even a third of them, but they're there for you to go over. If you're in the habit of going over your notes, that could be helpful. Read all the other scriptures that pertain to the subject at hand for today. So we continue with that first doctrine of infirmities and trials. The doctrine is this, whatever crook there is in your lot, it is of God's making. Uh, having considered the first part, the crook itself, we move today to chapter 3, as I said, uh, to the making of the crook or the crook ordained. And there's three main points, you'll see them on your outline there. there. Regarding the crook ordained, we see, first of all, God ordains the crook in the lot. And this is clear and perhaps has already become clear to you. And we observe three things like sub points. I didn't number them, but they are your outline. It's a disciplinary affliction. Very often the crook in our lot is a disciplinary affliction. Boston says the very nature of a crook, it's a disciplinary affliction. A crook 
It is a bent staff or a staff with a crook at the end for pulling sheep into line who go wandering off. And so by the very nature, no matter what the cause or the secondary cause, even our own actions or the actions of others on us that affect us, or even the actions of Satan, God may himself at times bring a crook into our lot sovereignly without a second cause as the sovereign Lord and judge. In Amos chapter 6, 3 and verse 6, is a trumpet blown in a city and the people are not afraid? Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? Uh, so firstly, it is a disciplinary Affliction. Secondly, it's a divine providence. Providence is the way that God orders the affairs in our lives. So it is a divine providence, the crook in our lot. God brings about every man's lot in all of its parts. So we can rest assured that there's no accidents here. There's no things that this is just fate that has happened to you and we'll kind of steer through it. No, God brings about every man's lot in all of its parts. And Boss, as Boston puts it, God sits at the helm of human affairs and turns them wherever he wills. So when things go really badly for you and it frustrates you, maybe even causes you to sin and anger or frustration, remember, God is at the helm of all of our affairs and he steers those. Psalm 135 Verse 6 makes this clear. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. In heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. Brothers and sisters, this should be a great encouragement to us, a great comfort to us, even though it will not do away with our afflictions. Just because we have a right view doesn't mean they're going to go away or they're going to get any less. If anything, they will increase. But the comfort is this. That there's nothing that happens to us without his overruling hand. Nothing that happens to us, done by others upon you, that you have no control over. Nothing in all the world that happens to us that does not have for the believer his overruling hand. As surely as God's providence is there in our very birth, the day you were born was not a mistake. He formed you in the womb. And so too is God's providential action in all the conditions and places allotted for us in this life. And if we could accept that and believe that, it would make our way much easier. Acts 17, 26 makes this clear. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places, everything. And it's not just in the major things, the outstanding events that mark our course, but as Matthew, Jesus preaches in the Gospel of Matthew, providence oversees the smallest and the most casual things about us. God directs and knows when a sparrow falls to the ground. He knows when a hair falls from our heads. That's what Matthew teaches us. Proverbs teaches us that even in the casting of lots, that was a practice in the Old Testament, God's hand is there. And those references are Matthew 10 and Proverbs 16. Here's the mystery of God's sovereignty, that even in the free acts of our will that we choose for ourselves, and there are many things that we just make a decision for ourselves, where we would live, what job you do, who you're going to marry, many things that we have full freedom, even in these, God directs by his providence. Proverbs 21, verse 1, a king's heart, and who's higher than a king, a despot, the ruler of the land, a president, if you like. King's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. So even in our freedom of choices and our own wills, he directs by his providence. Even the steps we take, the steps of others taken in reference to us. Jeremiah 10, 23, I know, O Lord, that the way of a man is not in himself, that it is not in man who walks to direct his steps. 
And again, this is a blessed peace for the believer. We can cling to this truth and say with the psalmist, I do not fear what man can do to me. We can honestly say, I do not fear what man can do to me because our steps are in his hands. Even when the steps causing the crooks in our lot are deliberate and are sinful, like the selling of Joseph into slavery by his own brothers. And it's also true when acts are unintentional, like in the Old Testament, acts slipping off, uh, off, off of the, uh, its shaft and, and killing a man, causing manslaughter, or a car accident that may disable or end a person's life. There is a holy and wise providence that governs the sinful and reckless acts of man. And what can we say to these things except what the psalmist says in Psalm 139? Such knowledge is too high for me. It is high, too wonderful for me. I cannot attain it. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. And that the third thing we have here is God by his eternal decree, appointed the whole of our lot, both in the crooked paths and in the straight. And there are straight paths, and there are many blessings which we enjoy as children of God. And there are times of peace and prosperity, but these are only to prepare us for the crook that is coming to us. Together with all things created, everything is brought in time to a perfect alignment with God's will. And this is the Christian's great comfort in these things. It's the mystery of providence in the government of the world in all its parts. It's the building constructed by God in exact conformity to his decree. And Ephesians 1.11 reminds us, according all things to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his will. What does this mean for us in the crooks that are in our parts? Well, here's the one thing. There's never a crook in your path that does not agree with his original plan. Sometimes things are so bad and we're like, what? Why has this happened to me? This cannot be God. But there is nothing that comes to us that is, does not agree with God's original plan. Job, in all of his affliction came to this conclusion, Job 23. And Job is a great passage to go through and read over while we're doing this study, uh, because that's all that it is about. Verse 13 and 14 of 23, but he is unchangeable. And you can turn him back. Think of the events in Job's life, a righteous man, nothing caused by his own sin, but the testing of God by Satan. Who can turn him back? What he desires is what he does, for he will complete what he appoints for me. And many such things are in his mind. Our first point then, God ordains the crook in the lot. And make no mistake about it, whatever your lot, however bad you may seem, and, and we're all guilty at times of saying, if this person's behavior was not like this, my life would be easier. This is not God. It is the sinful actions of man. It is in God's hands. And God, who is at the helm of all of our lives, he steers the ship. So the second thing, God ordains the crook, no doubt about that in our minds, how God makes the crook in the lot is the second part of this chapter. And there are two types of crook and Boston uh, deems fit to separate these two so that we can understand there are bad things. There are crooks that come into our lot that have nothing bad about them. They are pure, and yet they come, and there are crooks in our lot that are sinful, impure crooks. So pure and sinless crooks, these, he says, are mere afflictions and clean crosses. Afflictions and clean, clean crosses. These are grievous but not defiling. And we've given some examples in Scripture. Remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus. We're not given any details, but Lazarus was a poor man. God made it so. There was no sin involved, we're just told. 
he is, was a poor man. Jacob's two wives, you may remember, Rachel, the more beautiful one, was born barren. She couldn't have children. And Leah had weak eyes. They were born this way. And the man that was born blind from birth, and there's a classic example, crooks of this kind of God's making, not brought about by any particular sin or action of man. So God will put something in your life and you digging to, what did I do wrong? What evil is there in me that this should come to me? No, God sometimes says, here's a crook in your lot, as he did with Job. Well, God brings them to pass. He's the maker of the poor, says uh, Proverbs 15, 17, 5. Whoever mocks the poor insults his maker, who is glad at the calamity, will not go unpunished. He was glad. And the rich, 1 Samuel 2, 20, uh, verse 7. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. It is God who opens the womb or shuts the womb. And God who forms the eye of the man born blind. You remember the Pharisees' question to Jesus when he healed the man who was blind from birth. That was John 9 and verse 3. Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the work of God might be displayed. There was a crook in this man's lot unrelated to sin in his particular life. Exodus 4 and verse 11 then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? So three types of crook in the light of God's making in the fullest sense and the direct effects of his agency. Then there are um, impure lots, impure lots. First of all, the pure and sinless crooks. Secondly, impure, sinful crooks. And here Boston says these are in their nature both sins as well as afflictions, defiling as well as grievous. And remember, in our first point we spoke as disciplinary crooks, and that, that would come in here too. We can think of here the crook made in David's lot, King David. The family disorders and the mess in David's family in his later life, the defiling of Tamar, the murder of Amnon, the rebellion of Absalom, were all unnatural. The same kind of crook was made in Job's lot. Remember the Sabians and the Chaldeans who stole his livestock and murdered his servants. Crooks brought about by the sinful actions of men. And they were the afflictions of David and Job, respectively, but they were also brought about by sin. And what's the difference? The crooks of this kind are not by God's making in the same sense as the first ones were, where God just in his sovereignty, sovereignty puts a crook in our lot, the man born blind or whatever that crook may be. Uh, but God never incites anyone or evil in the heart of anyone. He never does stir anyone to commit evil. But he will use these. And James makes that very clear for us. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. Nevertheless, even those crooks in our lot that come from sin, of our making sin of others upon us, Satan himself uh, God, these are of God's making and by his permission, his powerful binding and his wise overruling of them to some good purpose. Under this heading, we must note three things concerning impure or, or uh, impure and sinful crooks. First thing, and it's a sub-point in your notes, God permits them. We've touched on this. God permits them crooks that are of our sinful making, other sins upon us. He permits them for holy reasons. Acts 14, verse 16, past generations he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. God doesn't author these sinful crooks or bring them about through his own making, yet he allows them. God, as we said in the introduction of the book, 
uses them for holy ends, and that is for our sanctification, as well as our chastisement that we came up in the first point, as he sees fit. And here again is the example of Joseph and his brothers. God allowed these men to bring chastisement and affliction through that which brought it about, although that which brought it about was not Joseph's sin. And so the sinful actions of his brothers involved him to suffer a crook in his lot. And the afflictions of Joseph served God's holy purposes for his life, though they originated with the acts of other sinful men. And in these crooks brought about by sin, God withholds his grace and restraint, as shown in the well-known scripture regarding Ephraim. In 417, Ephraim has joined himself to idols, leave him alone. And so God withdraws his hand of restraint and grace upon these at times. Psalm 81, 11 and 12, but my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsel. So God permits them. God withdraws his grace and his restraining hand from them. Boston says this kind of crook is of God's making as a just judge to punish the sufferer. Second Samuel sixteen eleven. David said to Abishai and to his servants, Behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjamite leave him alone? Let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. So God is using the sinful actions, David's sinful actions, to bring through the crooks in his lot punishment, chastisement to himself. That's the first thing God permits them. Secondly, he bounds them or he binds them. Uh, uh, Boston said he bounds them because they originate from sin and evil. God powerfully bounds any sinful crook. In our lot. And Psalm 76 Surely the wrath of man shall praise you, the remnant of wrath you will be put on like a belt. And Job here is the classic example. Maybe you've thought of it already how Satan comes and taunts the Lord, if you like, about uh, and the Lord goes to Satan defending his servant Job and how God binds the crook. Job 38 And I said, Thus far you shall come and no further, and here shall your proud wives be stayed. And of course in Job chapter 1 verse 12, right at the beginning of that chapter, Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand, only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And we know what Satan did. He stretched that binding to the limit. But he was not able to lay a hand on Job at the first. And we know how Satan continued to press the envelope, if you like, and press God and urge him that it was only because God did not inflict him and spare Job harm that he remained faithful. And again, God allowed the evil. And God around, and once again, God bound that crook. You but stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to his face, said Satan. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, it is in your hand, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And what happened? Satan did his worst. And had God not bound that crook, he surely would have taken Job's life. And here is a wonderful consolation and comfort to us when you face a trial that is enormous. You face a trial that this is going to break me. Just remember the affliction that God places on us. He binds them and he doesn't allow Satan to push the envelope. The third thing the Lord does with the impure crook is he overrules them. So he allows them, he bounds them, and thirdly, he overrules them. Are they sinful and pure crooks? God does not allow them to achieve sinful ends. That's the big difference. Jo jo Joseph's brothers were sinful, but God overrules and he 
turns those uh, to in line with his perfect will. While a sinner who does evil has an e- evil outcome planned in the crook that he creates, God directs it to a holy and good end. And think of David's disorders in his family that brought about by his own sin. Uh, Amon's desire was to grat- gratify his own brutish lust, lust, and Absalom meant to satisfy his revenge his pride and his ambition, these were sinful actions of men intended to do harm and bring evil. But God meant through these means to punish David for the sin against in the matter of Uriah. Second Samuel 2.10 Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. So sinful actions of men, wicked men who do their worst, God takes those and he says, that's the crook in your lot. He allows them, he restrains them, he bounds them, but he uses them to his own end. And in Job's case, the Sabians and those Chaldeans were all instruments of Satan's design. They came to kill and to plunder and to steal, and the raiders were there to satisfy their covetousness. They wanted what wasn't there. They were thieves. But God has his own design in these actions to prove Jacob's sincerity and uprightness. And if God had not overruled them and overruled the evil intents of these men's crooks, no good would have come out of them. But yet the evil of these men, good came out of them. And Job, God's servant, was justified in that. And here's a great lesson for us, brothers and sisters, when we face the many crooks in our lot, even the ones that are, that are a result of our own sin, God always overrules these to f- fulfill his own holy purposes, even if unintended by the sinner. God designs cannot miscarry. His purposes will stand. Isaiah 46 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purposes. So by the overruling of God's hand, the sinful crook is turned to his own glory and his people is good in the end according to his word. A great comfort, a great perspective, if you like, on the crook's in our lot of different kinds. Proverbs 16, 4, the Lord has made everything for his purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. And a verse that has been of great comfort to so many believers and continues to be, Romans 8, 28, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Same example in the life of Joseph and his brothers, sinful and devious actions. They wanted to be rid of him, yet it was of God's making. By his holy permission, by his powerful bounding, and by his wise overruling, that he wasn't killed, he was put in a pit. And he didn't die in that pit, but traitors came by. And it seems to get worse and worse and worse for Joseph, except for death. And even in the king's court, the things that befell a righteous man. And yet it was by God's permission, by his binding, by his overruling. Everything was perfectly aligned to his wisdom and his goodness. And this is a great point for us as believers. Uh, for the difficult things, and no matter what. And each of us could make a list of 20 things right here that are hard for us, we don't understand. Afflictions and physical ailments and trouble in our families, so many things. These are in the hands of God. They are of his making, even the evil ones, even the evil, evil ones. Come to the third and final point, main point, uh, and we... We great with time. So number number three, why God makes the crook in our lot? Why God makes the crook in our lot? You may know the answer to this already. And Boston says, by discovering the design of our trials, 
What is God's design in bringing the crooks, the trials and the infirmities of life into our lot? And he says it's important for us to know and carefully consider in order to benefit as a Christian from the crook in our lot. Why does God do it? And he gives us seven, seven reasons there, and they marked in, in, uh, uh, as number one to seven sub-points. It's a test of saving faith. He says, crooks in our lots are a test whether we are in a state of grace or not. And Boston maintains that this is the main providential tr- trial that we go through about our eternal state. Am I a believer or am I not? Is he a believer or is he not? And ongoing trials and infirmities in our lives allow us to prove over and over again because the infirmities come, they just take different shapes and different forms that we are in the faith. And we had a saying back in South Africa when the, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. I don't know if that's really true about South Africans, that's what they say. But perhaps we should word that when the crook falls into the lot of a believer, they endure and they continue to endure. And you may remember some of the would-be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ come to mind. I want to follow you. I want to be your disciple. Sell all you have. I've kept all you. Sell all you have. And what happens? He's out of there. He's out of there. I want to go and bury my father first. I have things to do. I'm going to get my life in order. So when difficulties come, they disappear. And are you thinking of the parable of the sower, of the soils, the seed which fell among the rocky soil? Matthew 13. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word, immediately receives it with joy. He's here with us. He becomes a believer, it seems. Yet he has no root in himself. He endures for a while when tribulation or persecution arises. On account of the word, immediately he falls away. Do you see what Sir Brooke says? This is one of the main things, is to test the genuineness of our faith. At the trial of Job, this was the test. The test of Job's state before God. Was Job an uprighteous? An upright and sincere servant of God, as God testified of him, or a self-serving hypocrite, as Satan alleges against him. And Job's trial was placed upon the crook in his lot. Listen to these verses, verse 8 to 12 of Job, chapter 1. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on earth, blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does God, Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. Stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So there's a great example. The first great trial, the first great crook that we see continue over and over again against the righteous man. And the reason, the purpose of God was this to test his faith and the genuineness of his faith. There's many other examples. You can look at them in your notes. Those just uh, stand out. Secondly, the second benefit and the reason, characteristic for the reason the crook in the Christian's life, it spurs us to obedience. Trials and difficulties have a way of weaning us from this world and prompting us to look to the happiness of the next world. Just as the restless young man wants to eat and drink and be merry, experience the things of the world, but He really needs to settle down and become serious. This is exactly the effect of trials upon the soul. And this was the experience of the prodigal son, you may remember, who went to sow his wild oats and spend all his money. Luke 15, verse 17, But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's highest servants have more than enough bread? 
but I perish here of hunger. And so over time, the crooks in our lots will convince us that our rest is not fine here and will keep us and spur us to obedience. And when our lot is straight, we are quick to forget the disciplines of the godly and the call to live holy lives and obedient lives. God, by these crooks, spurs us to become restless as we pass through this temporary home, not seeking the comforts and the ease and the rest here, but to lay up for ourselves treasure in heaven. Third characteristic, there are many references there, but we only have a few minutes. The third is this, it brings conviction of sin. And there's a good illustration. You have a man who's carelessly walking along, going for a hike in the mountains, must be Hayden again, going for his walk in the mountain, but he's careless at first, and the ground is uneven, and uh, at one point, he places his foot on uneven ground, and that's fine, but after a while, he starts limping, and he limps, and as he goes, it becomes worse and worse, even as he goes, the steps become more painful, and this convinces him of what? When I was careless, I took a wrong step. I took a wrong step. And so, says Boston, crooks in our lot remind us and bring to mind and convict us of sin. Jeremiah 2.26, as a thief is shamed in court, so the house of Israel shall be shamed. They, their kings, their officials, their priests, and their prophets Remember what happened when things started to go horribly wrong with Joseph's brothers. And they, Joseph got them into so much trouble knowing who they were and they feared for their lives. We read in Genesis 42, 21, Then they said to one another, In truth we are guilty concerning our brother. The crooks that God put there brought conviction of sin in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and did not listen That is why this distress has come upon us. And sometimes God will bring a crook into our lot to convict us of our sin. We must be careful here that we don't presume to interpret God's providence. Say, this has happened to me because of such and such. Sometimes we may know or have a very good idea, but especially do not presume to interpret God's providence in other people's lives. They may just be of his sovereign making, a pure and a sinless crook, but they may be of our own sin to bring conviction of sin. That uh, example in Judges 1-7, Adonai Bezek, that terrible king who cut off the thumbs. He says, 70 kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off. I used to pick up the scraps under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. They brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. David writes in Psalm 25, remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of the goodness of your goodness, O Lord. Number four, the fourth characteristic of the proposing the crook, uh, the pr- purpose of the crook in our lot, it's a corrective or punishment for sin. And we've, we've touched on this. It's very similar to the previous one. Uh, the, what Jeremiah writes uh, when he, in 2 and verse 19, your evil will chastise you. Your apostasy will reprove you. No one see that it is evil and bitter for you to, sake, to forsake the Lord your God. The fear of me is not in you, declares the Lord God of hosts. And God graciously sometimes passes over our sin, but he will bring it to us in the crook, in the lot, in due time. As with David in 2 Samuel 12, 10, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house. After all these things, his sin with Bathsheba, his big cover-up, the murder of Uriah, And when all is forgotten, God brings it to him and places this crook in his lot to bring him to conviction of sin. The sword will never depart from your house. 
In the Naaman's case, remember Naaman, the leper, 2 Kings 5.27, Therefore the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. So he went out from his presence a leper like snow. So Boston points out that this may be the case with sins that have been forgiven uh, from eternal wrath by God, as well as those who have not And one may have confessed and sincerely repented of the sin and yet go limping to the grave. And sometimes God does that to remind us of the sins of our youth. And he forgives our sins in Christ's name. But as a result of that crook, we go limping to the grave, though it doesn't carry us to hell, as Boston says. Fifthly, three more, it prevents sin. It prevents sin, bringing crooks into our lots, This is one of God's reasons it prevents sins. Hosea 2 and verse 6. Therefore I will hedge her up her way with thorns. I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths, her wicked paths. And Broston brings us a great lesson here. Defiling objects in the world often prove less ensnaring to us because they are suited to our particular temperaments by means of the crook and the light He says the paint and the varnish is stripped away. So things that our hearts, wickedness and the remaining sin in our hearts tend easily to go to. By the crook in the lot, God strips away the paint and the varnish. And those things eventually do not become as enticing to us. And so it prevents sins. As Job says in Job 33, 17, 18, that he may turn aside from his deed and conceal pride from a man. He keeps back his soul from the pit, his life by perishing, by perishing with a sword. Boston says if they would, and this quote is in your notes, if they would calmly consider what would happen to them if the crook were removed, they would bless God from their hearts by making it. So consider Sometimes the difficulty, the crook that God places in your lot is to prevent you to sin. To see the truth of the sin that you desire in your heart and to shun it and set it aside. The sixth characteristic, two left, the crook for the Christian, it uncovers latent corruption. It uncovers latent corruption. Like a fire pot, a pot on the fire Uh, And you cooking something up and makes the scum rise up, appear on top, and then uh, run over. So says Boston. So the crook of the lot stirs up from the bottom and brings such corruption that we would not otherwise have known was there. Who would have thought the meek Moses at the waters of Meribah, Psalm 106, they angered him at the waters of Meribah, And it went ill with Moses on their account, for they made his spirit bitter, and he spoke rashly with his lips. And so the crook of the Lord sometimes stirs up things in us that we didn't realize that I had this in me. And the things that I say and the things that I'm doing because of this crook, this is my remaining sin. And who would have thought that patient Job would have such an ill nature to charge God during his affliction when it was going so well with being cruel. Job 30, 21, you have turned cruel to me with the might of your hand to persecute me. And godly Asaph, we've mentioned him already, Psalm 73, uh, that he comes to a point where he just about denies all religion. He says, all in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands of innocence, a godly man who says, the wicked prosper, I suffer. This is useless, this is meaningless, and he nearly denounces religion. And so Boston says, the crook in our lot will reveal the depths of latent sin that make it obvious that our hearts are desperately sick. To keep our trust and dependence on him alone, for there's no good in us except what Christ has imputed and made possible in us. Finally, what's the benefit of the crook in our lot? It exercises grace. It exercises grace. We know that so well, that because of remaining sin, indwelling corruption, we're all of us liable to periods of 
spiritual laziness and inactivity that causes our graces to lie dormant for a while. There are graces such as patience and long-suffering that only occur under the right conditions. Crook in the Lord helps us stir up to exercise these graces that have been overpowered by corruption. And so when you feel far from God, and when you feel the godly disciplines, the young men are reading disciplines of a godly man, I think it's called, when these seem to disappear, you become spiritually lazy and inactive. It is through these trials that God will exercise your graces. Listen to 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it exercises graces. Boston says the crook in the lot gives rise to many acts of faith, hope, love, self-denial, submission, and other graces. It leads to many heavenly breathings and groanings which otherwise would not have been brought forth. Now, as I mentioned in the last part of this book, if you have the book, there's three uses of this doctrine. There's some objections and there's some considerations. We're not going to go in these, but I I think this has given us a good uh, basis to examine the crook in our lot and to know, to understand that God has ordained it and there are many good reasons for it, whether it be of our own sin or not. They are for our good and our lives. Christ is at the helm and he steers whatever comes to it. It is of God's making. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we bless you for, yes, even as your word tells us, to count it pure joy when we face trials of many kinds. Lord, we understand and we know our own wickedness and our spiritual laziness at times. And we know that we need these crooks in our lots. We need afflictions to purify us. We need difficulties to cause us again to look to you for grace and help and strength for all that we need. Lord, help us to have the right perspective, a godly perspective of the crook in our lot. And we bless you for these, for they keep us from sin. They prevent us from sin. They help us to see the wickedness of our own hearts and our need for the Savior. Lord, bless this teaching to our hearts and bless these scriptures that we may apply them to our lives. We pray now that you would go with us as we worship you in the rest of this day. All glory and honor and power and praise be to you, our King, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.